thank you so much for joining us, Tamara. Truly a pleasure having you in India and of course on Brand Equity. Great to be here. Thank you very much. Tamara, I'm so excited about this interview because you are probably, if I'm not wrong, the only global CEO in the advertising business. Says a lot, doesn't it? Well, I think it says uh, how disappointing <laughs> we should be as women that there certainly are more in uh, advertising and in fact in all industries. Sure, sure. Talking about, you know, your journey as, uh, you know, a professional and making it on top and, you know, a rare woman to be at the helm of a global organization, how has your journey been? I think my journey has been one where I've just focused on mm. uh, what I wanted to do in the vision and not got bothered by the bumps on the way. Sure. Because I think any woman who said they haven't had bumps on the way is not actually being very honest. True. So I certainly, when I was pregnant with my first child, interestingly, someone said I'd ruined my career. Wow. So I have had many things <laughs> that have uh, created some bumps, but actually I've been very clear about my passion for the work mm -hmm. and I think that is what's uh, kept momentum. Right. Uh, has there been any point in time where you have felt very demotivated because it has been difficult for you to shatter the glass ceiling? Of course you have shattered the glass ceiling and how and we all know that. But I mean in your journey towards you know the race to the top, uh, how difficult was it for you to you know break stereotypes, to uh, you know challenge people's uh, point of views on women and of course of course the surrounding environment which I mean ideally we would say that you know there, there is no difference but I'm sure there have been uh, you know several times where you've been forced to either reevaluate yourself as a woman or, or a boss etc etc I think what's uh, incredibly interesting and why I believe women haven't done as well as they should have done is because men employ in their own image and, and that means, of course, employ more men. <laughs> so uh, my observation is sometimes I have noticed that I, I'm very passionate and very energized about my work. Mm -hmm. And that has been at times people have attributed that to my female nature. And I felt that was holding me back. So yes, I have evaluated uh, how I've behaved. I have evaluated also how I've looked uh, as women. People often feel they can make comments about what you look like or the clothes you wear. Sure. But net, 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 but I always tell people, in the end, it is the being, your being, and your vision for the job, which is going to make you succeed. But what would you say would be the defining difference between, let's say, a woman like you, who's made it, and let's say women who are aspiring to be on top and shatter that glass ceiling. What do you think, you know, the key difference is? I think total conviction and self-belief mm. that uh, one is always going to get there mm. and actually wanting to get there. Mm. I think the combination of self-belief, wanting to get there and realizing that leading anything you need followers. So this is not about being competitive or differentiating, it's about bringing the world with you. And how, how easy is it for uh, you, know, you to have followers and for you to you know, basically convince people that you have leadership qualities? How difficult is that road? I think it is difficult to convince people that you're the right person mm. if you focus on that. Mm. However, if you focus on the doing, and if you focus on inspiring people while you're doing it, then I think there is uh, more chance. You know, you're a mother of two. Yes. Uh, and uh, I want to talk to you about, you know, two points of views from very, very successful yes. women. Uh, one being Indira Nui and the other being Sheryl Sandberg. And they're very, two very diverse schools of thought. One being, Indira being, that, you know, as the global CEO, she's like, I mean, I'm kidding myself and kidding everybody else when I say that I can have it all that I can have a great family life and I can be, you know, this really successful woman. I mean, there are certain bargains and sometimes there are heavy bargains and, you know, the fact of the matter is you've got to choose. Sheryl Sandberg, on the other hand, says that I can have it all. I can be like a great mother, a great wife, a great family woman and I can be a really, really successful professional. Where are you leaning? I think the question about having it all probably is a long question in life anyway. <laughs> but um, I, I passionately love everything I do. So I passionately love my work and passionately love my children. So on one level, of course, I feel I, I'm deeply lucky and have it all. On the other, in each area, of course, there's always going to be uh, some compromise or some sense that it isn't perfect because life isn't perfect. However, 
for me, life is full of many blessings. And so I, if you ask me to pick between the Cheryl School, I'll, I'll have to go with that one. Because oh, really? I feel, yeah, because I feel deeply blessed. And, and I feel blessed in an unbalanced way. I think life for me is not about balance. Life to me is about going 100% at everything. And if it means uh, keeping your children up at mm. night when they were little to talk to them rather than put them to bed early, hey, that's what I did. Mm. Go for everything with 200%. Right. I want to talk to you about something that is a bit sensitive and tricky, yes. which is, uh, you know, the previous uh, CEO of JWT, I, and I've had, I've met him in India and, and in Cannes, and, you know, you took over at a time where, you know, I think the fundamentals of the agency were shaken up because of, of the incident. Um, how was it, how was the environment when you came in and took, you know, took the reins from him? And uh, now that you've, you know, you've settled in and you've understood what happened, uh, how, how, how do you think that whole episode has transpired within the cultures of your agency and what are you doing to ensure that what, whatever transpired, right or wrong, um, you know, fair or unfair, how are you ensuring that, you know, uh, such behavior is reined in? The first thing to say is coming in, as you can imagine, as a woman, a global CEO of the oldest advertising agency in the world was an extraordinary privilege. Of course. And I took it as that privilege and I took my task of really making sure everyone can be at the best they can be. Yep. So in order to be at the best we can be and in order to have a company that is delivering ideas in the modern world, I took a view that we need to enable our talent and to be the most diverse company we can be, to have the most divergent views, in order to have the best thinking, in order to deliver the best creativity. Mm -hmm. So the task I set myself and the whole company in every office around the world is to say to ourselves, have we got the, the most divergent and the best capability we can have? And have we got the best culture that enables that? Okay, okay. But what's interesting is that, you know, um, the woman who had, Erin, uh, your, your global copcom person, who actually filed a complaint against Gustav was actually joined back. And how's that going? And, uh, you know, how is the whole, uh, uh, you know, environment now with her coming back? She has indeed come back. And I believe um, in all circumstances, everyone has an entitlement to, uh, uh, to be given fair voicing, to have fair chances in life. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't like all this judgment by social media, so I think okay. that's a, a terrible thing. Uh, how do I feel again? You know, in India, uh, we've grown 20%, uh, we'll grow 20% this year. We want 140 pieces of new business. So how do I feel it's going? I think we're going from uh, strength to strength. On another note, yeah. <clears throat> leaving the, the Gustavo episode aside, broadly in advertising, uh, you know, sexism in the world is yeah. one, but how is sexism in the advertising business? Uh, not only in terms of, you know, uh, the content we put out, but also in terms of, you know, within the advertising world, because unfortunately, this is a more progressive industry, you right? This is a much more hip, much more forward thinking. Despite that, I think women have made a lot more progress in other industries, where, uh, you know, uh, yeah. not, not in advertising. Uh, uh, I think that's a tremendous question. I, I'm incredibly disappointed that in our industry, which is about uh, meeting people's needs, about engaging with all the population, that we haven't made more progress. Um, but I, I absolutely convinced that people have woken up and um, will do the things that need us to address our representations of the community we live in not just women by the mm -hmm. way i mean i work in america we don't represent all our ethnic communities sure. to the percentage mm -hmm. that we should do so i think people are now putting a lot of things in place to do that and the second thing you mentioned which i think is also critical is we create ideas that represent our role model that are role models that also represent the work mm -hmm. uh, the people we around around us and i don't feel we've represented women always in the right way. There has been a fair bit of stereotyping. So I'm really expecting and hoping, because of me being the CEO, because of the enormous work we've done in the agency, that uh, we will be much better at not stereotyping, at really representing all communities as they are. Also, when I look at India, which I'm incredibly proud of, and because I'm here, you know, we have 50% of our leadership being women in India, mm. probably the greatest percentage. So uh, I think it just shows with the right leadership and putting the right people in place, we can make enormous change. Tamara, I find it interesting that you say that people have finally woken up 
uh, to yes. gender equality because you know and I know that we've just gone through a presidential election and we saw <clears throat> that we saw those campaigns and you know before I talk to, want to talk to you about really analyzing both those campaigns yes. I want to first talk to you about how much of it do you think uh, was the fact that America didn't want a woman on top I actually think very little is about uh, wanting a woman on top. I think the election from America, I could talk about Brexit, mm. if you like, it was about the fact that probably 20 to 30 percent of the communities in both countries felt excluded from the wealth that has been taking place through globalization and the technological revolution. I think those elections, and I think the, particularly the Donald Trump election, was about exclusion, was about not understanding that many people had not had the wealth and advantages from the growth that America had seen. And I think, interestingly, the media and even some of the pollsters had not understood and had not gone to those communities to realize how disillusioned and disenfranchised these people felt. So you don't think that, you know, a campaign that was so sexist, that was so over the top, that was almost derogatory, um, still won that campaign and that brand still won the election. You're, not, you're saying it has nothing to do with, uh, are we looking to ignore the fact that it was possibly, uh, you know, a woman who was, who was running against yeah. him and if it was any other man would have possibly had a better chance at winning? I think the narrative mm. in American election mm -hmm. was incredibly disappointing mm. uh, and shocking and we need really to think about that as we go forward. It was uh, difficult, I think, not just for women, I think it was difficult for many communities. Sure. And um, however, I think what people vote for often is economics and what's in their pocket and a sense of hope for their future. So even though as a woman, I have to be honest, I found it uh, uh, disillusioning, uh, angry making, uh, inappropriate, um, and I could go on. I think in reality, for women and for men, they wanted, uh, certainly those excluded, a sense of hope and uh, a lack of fear about what was gonna happen to them for their jobs and for their lives. <laughs> You know, as an advertising professional, person, a person who, uh, whose business is understanding the pulse of, the, of, of people, right, and uh, emotions, do you think the entire industry, despite, you know, our grand leaps into data and, you know, big data and fast data and God knows what other data, um, uh, the whole industry, I think, got it completely wrong. I mean, and not just the, not just advertising. I think even media and, and and you know exit polls and all of that. Everybody got it completely wrong. So does that tell us something about the state of our understanding of human emotion and people today? I think it tells us two things actually. Mm. Um, if you're going to understand people, you need to be with people and you need to be there in those locales. And actually what's happened to the media, I think, in, in America, is that it's gone very much to uh, the bigger cities and not in the rural areas, and so they miss that completely. The second thing is, uh, research is much more interesting than what people tell you, it's how people behave. Mm. And I think po polling probably hadn't moved on, and just because someone says they're gonna do something doesn't mean they are. I think we should have learned this from Brexit. <laughs> so listening to people more actively, listening to what drives them, so uh, a moment about J. Walter Thompson. I have to say we did predict. Okay. We did predict this. And I'm going to tell you why we did. Because we looked at motivations. Uh -huh. And we didn't look at what they how they said people were going to vote. And we looked at anger. And we looked at how if people wanted to change. And because anger was high and that mo people wanted to change, then we thought that was predictive of Trump. And what we did is we took out New York from our polling and we took out uh, some of the cities in California and that's how we got it right. Oh is it? Yes it's very interesting. So not to look at what people say mm. but to look at what mo one of the motivations behind them and how they feel. So what, what would you say the fate of research will be after both these very large events Brexit and, and, the, and the presidential elections? We got to our conclusion through research. <laughs> <Okay>. so, <laughs> so I think research, right, uh, research is only going to 
because we know what, what people, how people are behaving, what they're buying, where they are, whatever time, I think research is going to be ever more important. Okay. But people need to look at motivations, they need to look at behaviours, mm -hmm. and not just what people say. Mm -hmm. Because I'll tell you what, on social, people are used to saying what they want people to believe, mm -hmm. not necessarily what they do believe. Uh, do you think, uh, you know, when we were looking at both Brexit and, and the presidential yes. election, yes. on social media I felt that we were a bit, uh, you yes, know, good question. we were a bit uh, secluded. I mean, because yeah, what was being represented on social media, I mean, it was so actually removed from reality is what we all got. So do you think, uh, you know, digital is made too much of uh, only because it's new, it's hip, and it's something we don't understand completely? I am very concerned, genuinely, about uh, the digitalization of news stories. Mm. We, we heard a lot about fake stories. I'm also concerned that the algorithms of stories means that we get more myopic and more myopic. Sure. So I have a Facebook feed, obviously news feed, and I never see anything that's beyond what I believe in, exactly. uh, rather than serendipity. So there's fake stories and controlling stories. I'm also concerned that in a world where people are used to academic exploration, that people don't ask fundamental questions anymore, so that the truth people see in, 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 in so many characters what they believe. Sure. I think that's going to have a very damaging effect on um, democracy, uh, because it actually will be about money in order who gets in, not about people having a point of view, because they won't have access to a point of view. Mm -hmm. So I'm very worried about social media and the effect sure. on that. Sure. Um, I actually think we live, what, what we've learned is social media is vital for building brands, but social media, as well as TV, as well as particularly print in this country and outdoor, and the ROI is much more mixed than everyone thinks. Mm. It is the combination of surrounding consumers that works more than just one media. Sure. So I'm a great believer in TV. Look at how marvelous the film industry is in here. So I think TV, films, it's just they're going to be in different platforms. Sure. So it's that mix. What does it tell you about the consumer? Do you think the consumer, uh, and this is really your study, and this was your study of understanding the political consumer, yes. you know, post-Brexit and, of course, the elections. What is it telling you about the consumer today? I'm, and I'm asking you this because, at first, I want to get your response because I have a rejoinder uh, because I feel today a lot of brands uh, are living in their own bubble and are going all out to position themselves like NGOs. Uh, which they're not, but it's just that, you know, that positioning that they have, which is a bit over the top and not really authentic. The first thing is we, all brands need to position themselves in, in, in really authentically because mm. the consumer sees mm. through that. Mm -hmm. However, the one thing I take a, um, some issue with you is I think brands are filling a vacuum that sadly governments and politicians no longer are. Okay. Which is about, actually people want brands to do good as well as to do good business. So even though purposeful brands, I think is what you're getting at, yeah. may seem a little bit uh, uh, over the top and a little bit too inspirational, actually I think they're filling a vacuum. I think people want brands to inspire, want the world to be a bit better. However, how that, could you say that? Well, I can say that. I'll tell you why I can say that. I think young people make choices for the companies they work in and for the brands they pick if they do deliver good thing, uh, benefits to them, I mean, you know, the right value, but they also will pick it if they're doing good. So assuming the basics are right, mm. then they want to be part of something that's doing a little bit better for the world. And actually, I think longevity in companies will rely on not just having great products, which is also important, but having great products that in the air and also doing some good. But, you know, both recent global events have shown us that people have voted for exclusivity instead of inclusivity. So I, I'm, I'm a bit confused about that no. people have, uh, I, I agree with you, there's a huge growth um, in uh, nationalism, which is uh, really bothering me actually. Um, uh, or certainly the voted the vote the people who voted voted for some ethnic nationalism let's call it that sure. in a very brutal way yeah. let's not use the word populism which lets people off the hook let's use it what it is but first of all not all the young people voted which is very disappointing okay and secondly when I look at all the surveys about young people in work and millennials and the generation after them so uh, they actually do want to work for much more diverse 
companies. Interestingly, when we look at they want to, they like to work collaboratively, and they like to work for mixed communities. Mm. And added to that, they want to work for companies that are doing good. So, it, so there's a there is a paradox often that happens in the world. Okay, there is this growth in in some nationalism. I don't think we should deny it. I think we should really see it for what it is mm. and, mm. and worry about it. Sure. And yet, at the same time, there is a whole force out there for uh, doing good, for being part of good, for, for um, hoping that the planet is going to be here a lot longer, you know, a lot of environment, quite rightly because of So I see both these things happening at the same time. And um, my hope and my inspiration is, is that these young people will have more of a voice mm. and, and will turn us into, uh, take away some of this very hard-edged narrative. So you think um, that consumers care? I think consumers care, I think people care, but people need certain things. They don't care beyond the pound or beyond the rupee in their pocket, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And they don't care if a product isn't good enough. Okay. So we have to get these basics right. And we haven't done things right for them. You know, the, they have been excluded from the economy. And women aren't 50% of leadership okay. positions. So I think we owe it to the communities to make sure that uh, we give people education and health and enable them to grow. Mm -hmm. Talking about India, uh, I know this is your first visit as, you know, as a global visit, CEO. Yes. Uh, so tell me a little bit about your understanding of how you think India is doing as a market. Do you think we're very overrated? Uh, or, and, and, I, and I know that you know you can only be as candid, you know, as possible. But uh, well, I should be very candid. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's been an extraordinary <laughs> ride in India, hasn't it? I mean, <laughs> uh, we won't talk about this week <laughs> some of the issues bothering sure. you today. Sure. But if you take that away okay. and let's let's pretend it was pre now, <laughs> I mean, the fastest growing, you know, seven point five, seven point eight, wherever you measure yep. success extraordinary technological uh, advances. Uh, what, what advances? What well, for example, you have a uh, fantastic tech, you look at what's happening in um, the schools and the universities, uh, the fact that people are coming here for Indian capability, you look at the growth. Um, now, that, not to say there aren't some fundamental issues on poverty, they're sure. not to say there aren't things to address, mm. not to say there shouldn't be more inclusion, mm. uh, but I think it's been uh, extraordinary advancement. A and just in my own Joe Walter Thompson world, uh, uh, I would say India probably is our fastest growing country, and why? It's not just because the GDP is growing, mm. it's because the way the team working the company much more collaborative uh, much more mixed capability and uh, a m interestingly more open culture mm. and I'm going to take some learning from what I see on our great Indian office and take it around the world but tomorrow tell me why is it then not just in JWT but you take you take any group yeah. why is it that the Indian office is still not in the top five offices of the world well I think you have to look at spend per person um, I would have to say, though, the influence of India in uh, our community is enormous. Is it? It is absolutely enormous. And added to that, um, India doesn't report into Asia. India reports directly to me. Okay. Because that's how important India is. Oh wow! Was that uh, was that always the case, or this is after you've come? No, uh, in the last uh, year and a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, it, it says a lot for to run our leader, but it also says a lot for what we're doing and a lot for the country. Right. What is your vision and what is your desire for Tamara's legacy in GWT? What's the kind of legacy you want to leave behind? Well, uh, too early, too early, too early, early to leave, leave a legacy. But I, I'll tell you what I'm thinking about. Mm. Uh, I, ho I hope my I hope it'll be a 15, 20 year journey. So I'm not about <laughs> maybe a lifetime journey. Not like about to leave a legacy. What What do I want to see though? I I want to see us continuing to pioneer brand, uh, to see extraordinary work, even better work than we're doing now. I would like us to build. Uh, a much more diverse community mm -hmm. and really broaden our capability. Uh, we have to constantly be, it, a success for me would be that we're seen constantly on the edge of where the world is going and that we're uh, in very simple terms 
a magnet for people. People love working there and a magnet for our clients. Mm -hmm. uh, how about more materialistic desires such as, you know, JWT being at the, you know, being one of the top uh, winners at Cannes, possibly being Agency of the Year? Uh, well, if, if you want to see, I have some goals, uh, which are financial goals. Obviously, we want to see growth. We, I'd like to see the company at least 50% digital by 2020. Okay. And without doubt, I want us to be Network of the Year by 2020. Those are the internal goals I've set ourselves. Right. So, will we see an improved performance? Only because, you know, the only, uh, it, it doesn't mean anything, but I mean, at CAN, will we see an improved performance of, of GWT? Yeah. To be clear, we measure ourselves very strictly. This is nothing fluffy. Mm. We went from 18 the year before in Cannes. We're now 82 Cannes Awards. Mm. Uh, as you know, we won Girlfest here. Um, so we are very clear you will see continual performance in Cannes. I will measure myself to that and hold myself to account as I will hold our whole team to account. Absolutely. On that note, Tamara, thank you so much. God bless. It's been a complete pleasure and uh, kudos to you for achieving what you have and hopefully many women will follow in this industry. I hope so. See you soon. <laughs>